So in this video, we're going to talk about electricity, and we'll start with a discussion on some fundamental electrical concepts. So the first is the voltage, V, which is the electric potential difference. So if we have a higher voltage, this essentially means more energy per charge. And as you might suspect, the voltage is expressed in volts. Then we have the current, I. And the current is the flow of electric charge. So you can think of the voltage as what's providing the energy to see or to achieve the flow of electric charge. So the higher the current, well, this means more charge movement. And the current is expressed in amperes. Then lastly, we have the resistance, R. And as you might suspect once again, the resistance is the opposition to current flow, where if we have a higher resistance, we have a reduction in the current, and the resistance is expressed in ohms. And this brings us to Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is a very simple expression that relates the three. It is V equals IR. So for example, let's say we have a 16 volt circuit, and we know that we have two amperes of current, and we're trying to determine the resistance. Well, we can simply finish this expression and then solve this problem, where we would get R, the resistance, is equal to 8 ohms. So now let's talk more about how current travels through matter and the materials that either support it or prevent it. So when electric current flows, it can generate a significant amount of heat, which poses several risks, including shocks and fires. So it is indeed the current that poses the danger when working with electricity. It's a common misconception that the voltage is what poses the danger, but in fact, it is the current. And that's because high currents can even be fatal. They can disrupt nerves, they can cause burns, again because of that significant heat generation, and they can even stop the heart. But for this to happen, current has to be able to flow. And materials that allow current to flow are considered conductors. And conductors are materials that allow for easy electron flow which makes them useful in electronics. So technically speaking, we are conductors in the sense that current can flow through us, much to our detriment. But traditionally, conductors mean materials that are used in electronics so they can conduct electricity efficiently, like copper or aluminum in things like wires. Now, oppositely, we have insulating materials, or insulators, which instead of allowing easy electron flow, resist electron flow. And therefore, they're used to protect against electrical hazards. So some, com some common insulating materials include many different types of polymers, wood, cellulose, fiberglass, there's a very long list, but they're always or almost always used to protect against the dangers of current in electronic devices. Think of essentially any electronic you've ever used. It likely has some sort of hard plastic outer case or something similar. This isn't just for mechanical protection, but it also provides electrical protection. It insulates. So if we want to return to the dangers here of current, we can think of ourselves as the conductors vulnerable to the dangers of current, and we can think of the safety equipment that prevents this from happening as our insulators. Now lastly, we have grounding. And grounding is what provides a low resistance path for excess electricity, directing it safely to a reference point like the Earth, and thus we call it grounding. Now we can understand much of this through our example here on the right. Here we have somebody in their car, and in frame A of the image, we have the person sitting in their car, and in frame B, they're lying on the ground next to the car. And if we were to ask ourselves the question, would the person in A or B more likely to suffer serious harm if they were struck by a lightning bolt? Which would it be? Well, the answer is B. But why? Well, in A's case, the person, again, is sitting inside their car. So if a lightning bolt were to strike this person, again, electricity will follow the path of least resistance and it will go to the lowest potential. So in between its path from the person to the ground, it's going to face some very high resistance parts of the vehicle, such as these rubber tires. Rubber is an insulating material. Whereas in person B's case, the only thing along its path is the person herself. So there's very little resistance to the ground. So person B, is much more likely to suffer the consequences of high currents, whereas person A 
has protection afforded by the vehicle. So now let's talk more about basic circuits. So a simple or basic circuit includes three main components. The first is a power source, which is typically a battery. The second is a conductive path, which are typically wires. And the last is a load, which is a power drawing component like that of a light bulb. Now, if we refer to our diagrams on the right, we can see how each of these components are illustrated. First, we have the power source or the battery, which is typically illustrated with these two lines, the longer of the two being the positive terminal of the battery. Now remember, current flow is defined to be in the positive direction. So current will flow through the diagram in this manner, starting from the positive terminal and connecting back to the negative terminal. Now next, we have the conductive path, the wires, which are typically illustrated as these simple straight lines. And then lastly, we have the load, which is again our power drawing component. And in these diagrams, we have bulbs as our load. In A, we have two, and in B, we have three. Now let's consider the two main configurations for basic circuits, circuits in series and circuits in parallel. So for a circuit in series, components are in a single path, which means that if one component fails, then the entire circuit breaks. And in the context of a circuit which is powering bulbs, the bulbs share voltage, which makes them relatively dimmer. So here in A, we have an example of a simple circuit in series where we have these two bulbs in series. They are in a single path. So let's imagine this first bulb fails. Well then necessarily this second bulb fails because as current leaves the power source and it reaches that first bulb, well, if it fails, well then no current can continue on to the second bulb. So now let's compare this to parallel circuits. Well, in parallel circuits, components have separate paths. So if one component fails, the others will stay lit. And again, in the context of a circuit that's powering light bulbs, each bulb receives full voltage, which makes them relatively brighter. And in B, we can see a simple example of a parallel circuit. Here we have our three bulbs, again, all in parallel. They have separate paths. So let's say this first, this leftmost bulb were to fail. Well, current leaves the positive terminal and flows around the circuit, but again, each path is independent. So maybe this first bulb fails, but it will not affect the ability to power these other bulbs. So this is the main difference, and this is a very fundamental and important aspect to simple circuits. So now let's extend our conversation around basic circuits by introducing a few more critical components, the first of which being switches. So switches are what are used to control circuit operation by either opening, turning off, or closing, turning on the path for the current flow. So if we refer to our diagram here at the bottom right, we can see that a switch is included. And as it's depicted, this switch is closed. Switches are depicted as open when this straight line is placed upwards at an angle. In other words, it's not making contact from one side of the conductive path to the other. So let's consider how this works in practice. As current flows around the circuit and reaches the switch, if the switch is closed, well then it can flow across the switch as it would a normal wire. But if the switch were open, well then current cannot flow and therefore the circuit is turned off. Now the second important component to talk about are resistors. And resistors are used to control the current flow and the voltage levels to prevent component damage and they're typically illustrated in simple circuit diagrams as we see here on the right by these zigzagging lines. But you might notice this is labeled as the load, but why? Well, these loads, these power drawing components have resistance themselves. So for this reason, they're often depicted in the same matter because this is what's relevant to the circuit. However, it's very important not to confuse the two. They are not the same. A load, yes, has resistance, but its function is to draw power to perform some sort of role, like a light bulb producing light. It has resistance, but its purpose is not resistance. Conversely, a resistor's function 
is explicitly to introduce resistance to the circuit. It does not draw power, and it does not perform other roles. Now lastly, we have to discuss two important safety measures, circuit breakers and fuses. And the main difference between the two is that fuses are essentially a one-time function, whereas circuit breakers can be reset and reused. Circuit breakers are switches that will automatically open the circuit when an overload is detected, essentially excess current. Fuses, on the other hand, are thin wires that will melt and physically break the circuit when excessive current flows, again, in order to prevent damage. So we can see an example of a fuse here illustrated in the diagram. So let's consider how this would work. Current leaves the positive terminal of the battery to flow around the circuit. If there's no excessive current flow, well then current will flow across the fuse as it would a normal conductive path. But if there is indeed excessive current, well again, the fuse, the wire that constitutes the fuse, will melt. So this connection will be severed and we essentially have an open switch and this will turn off the circuit. It will break the circuit. Now circuit breakers are essentially the same thing, except again, they're not made of these thin wires. They can be reset. And you'll see these often indicated by this symbol. So let's talk about one more key component and idea here in the context of basic circuits. And that is that of a jumper wire and a short circuit. So for example, let's say we had a jumper wire here in our circuit. And a jumper wire is essentially a wire it will jump from one port of the circuit to another. So we have current flowing from the positive terminal of the battery, and when it reaches this point here, this node formed by the circuit and the jumper wire, well, instead of continuing on and through this fuse, it's going to take the path of least resistance. So it's going to travel across this jumper wire, and it's going to return to the negative per terminal of the battery. So if this happens, the circuit is shorted. There's no resistance to resist the current flow, and this can be very dangerous. This can damage electronics, this can cause fires, and it also makes the function of the circuit essentially useless. So short circuits are very important. They don't only occur via jumper wires, but if you have this type of electrical connection, you can sh short the circuit or you can short a particular component. So now let's take a look at two more examples of different circuits. We'll start here with the one on the left. So in the con current configuration, if we were to ask ourselves which of the lamps, one, two, or three, or multiple of them, will light up without changing the position of the switches. So we can see this switch, labeled switch two, is open, and the other switch, labeled switch one, is also open. So again, what would happen? Well, so long as this switch two is open, none of the bulbs will light up. Current will flow from the positive terminal and it cannot continue through the circuit to power any of these bulbs, because again, this switch is open. No current can flow beyond it. But what would happen if we were to close this switch? Now let's consider. Well, in this case, current can flow across the switch, and it's going to power lamp one. So now we know at least lamp one will be powered. But what about lamps two and three? Well, lamps two and three are in parallel. So remember, they have separate paths and therefore can be treated independently. So if we keep this switch one open, but switch two is now closed, current will flow through switch two, it will power lamp one, and then it will continue to flow through lamp two to power lamp two until returning back to the negative terminal of the battery. If switch one is open, well then it cannot power lamp three. If we were to also close switch one, so now that all of the switches in the circuit are closed, well then lamps one, two, and three would all be powered. Now what about our example here on the right? We have something a bit different. So again, let's consider what would happen in the circuit if we do not change the position of the switch. We leave this switch open. Well, current leaves from the positive terminal, it will travel through the circuit, and it's not going to travel here because again, this switch is open. So it will continue on to power lamp one, but then where does it go from there? Well, we can see this wire here is shorting this other lamp. 
So even though it may look like current can undisrupted flow to lamp two, it's this wire that will short the circuit and prevent that from happening. So in this case, we would see the path for the current look like this. It's going to flow across lamp one, it's going to travel across this wire, and it's going to return to the negative terminal here. So again, it's because of this shorting wire that this happens, as well as due to the position of this switch. So we covered a lot of ground in this lesson, so let's be sure to review some of the most important points. First of all, we started with a discussion of some of the most fundamental electrical concepts, namely the voltage V, the electric potential difference, the current I, the flow of electric charge, and the resistance R, the opposition to that current flow. Then we talked about what happens when current travels through matter. We said that current can be very dangerous, largely because it can generate a significant amount of heat, but it also poses other risks, like that of shocks and or fires. We then moved on to a discussion of simple circuits and said that simple circuits have three main components. The first is a power source, typically a battery. The second is a conductive path, most often wires. And the third is a load, which is a power drawing component, such as a light bulb. Then we said there's two main types of configurations for simple circuits, circuits in series and circuits in parallel. In series circuits, components are in a single path. If one fails, the entire circuit breaks. Also, in simple circuits, loads share voltage. So in our example of bulbs, these bulbs will share a voltage, which will make them dimmer. Then, in contrast, in parallel circuits, components have separate paths. If one fails, others will stay lit. And in this case, instead of sharing voltage, each component will receive full voltage. So again, in our example of circuits, which include bulbs, each bulb receives full voltage, which will make them brighter. Then we extended our conversation about simple circuits by covering a few more critical components. The first was switches, which control circuit operation by either opening, turning off, or closing, turning on the path for the current flow. The next was resistors, which control current flow and voltage levels to prevent component damage. They intentionally introduce resistance to the circuit. And the last were circuit breakers and fuses, which are both important safety measures to prevent component damage and more significant bodily harm. In the case of fuses, we said that these were thin wires that melt and break the circuit when excessive current flows, and again, to prevent damage. So the main difference between fuses and circuit breakers is that fuses must be replaced after they've served their purpose, whereas circuit breakers need only to be reset in order to be reused.